how, how, how are we doing, as they say in those weird <coughs> contexts? How are you all doing? And how are you all doing? And I'm doing very well, thank you very much. Although, I have to say, this is the moment where I always feel a little bit like that um, Communist Party recruiter on Hyde Park Corner soapbox, standing there to talk about recruiting and telling the news of what's happening in the world and saying they are shooting our brothers and sisters in Chile, they are waging war on our brothers and sisters in South Africa, our brothers and sisters are fighting and dying in Palestine, join us! It's that kind of time. We're going to be talking about war, wars of empire, wars of race, wars of gender, economic wars, surviving wars, wars of religious extremism, wars of imperialism. We're going to be talking about surviving wars abroad, surviving wars at home. We're going to hear from two political prisoners, former political prisoners, out now. We're going to talk at the same time as we discuss the challenges we face about the power in our hands. We're going to talk about agency and organizing. And as Linda put it, what we do right and what we have yet still to correct what we do wrong. But I want to start by reminding us of two years ago, Matt Meyer reminded me of this. How many of you two years ago in this very hall, at this very moment in the conference, as we kicked off the left forum, had a fan in your hands that promoted a protest calling for the release of Oscar, Oscar Lopez Rivera? How many of you had a fan that you waved to publicize that protest. And how excited are we that we will be hearing from Oscar Lopez Rivera today. Oscar, who, to put it correctly, thank you, Matt, is the long, was the longest serving political prisoner in the history of US-Puerto Rico relations will be addressing this august gathering. And I want you to consider the role that we all of us played, or maybe we didn't play enough, in getting him released. It wasn't anywhere near soon enough. I think we're going to talk tonight about how it wasn't right in the first place. One of the things that I draw from this conference every year is the opportunity to go deep as well as to go broad. We always talk about going broad and we need to go broader and we make, need to make connections that are richer and more real. Um, but we also in this conference get a chance to go deep and to study. And, and I've been happy and, and, and privileged to be part of a series co-produced with Chris Hedges and Rick Wolf studying classic texts. Um, and we just wrapped up the session that we had, overflow session on the work of Gramsci uh, and the prison notebooks. And I come to this session conscious of the message of that one, which was that much as we learn and appreciate the challenges we face and the intersected natures of our oppression, so too we need to relish one another to celebrate one another, and together to create a culture of an anti-hegemonic movement that will be glorious in its revolutionary potential and effect. So I want to encourage us to create an atmosphere of love and celebration and enjoyment in our movements, because these have to be movements that we want to be part of. We have to have the social in socialism. We have to have the party in party. So if I had just one message, it would be that let's wage a cultural revolution of spirit, which begins <coughs> with the understanding that while we may not have won yet, we are a whole lot closer to winning than we were, and the other side is a whole lot closer to having lost. 
I see you're going to need the left forum to persuade yourself of this idea. Well, that's why we're here. So, relish one another, rev relish revolutionary transformation. We're going to start with a cultural worker, an artist, a writer, a contributing editor for Vice, the illustrator of Matt Taibbi's book, The Divide. She's now working on a book, Brothers of the Gun, f collaborating with um, two Syrians who have spent years, two years, living under ISIS. I give you Molly Crabapple. Thank you so much, and I'm so honored to be here. Before I start this talk about state repression, I wanted to mention that 214 people were arrested on the January 20th protests during Trump's inauguration. They were kettled on the streets, they were rounded up, and they were charged with felony rioting. Several of the defendants are journalists, and they're facing up to 10 years in prison. And while we honor the former political prisoners that we have on this panel, like Oscar Lopez Rivera and Sekou Odinga, we must fight to make sure that no one else ends up locked in a cage for their politics. Four months. It's been four months since the Tangerine Mussolini ascended to the White House. Four months of attacks on the press, of fascists in the streets, of mothers of all bombs being dropped, of moms locked in immigration detention centers, and of climate agreements torched. Four months of a news cycle that ping-pongs between horror and stupidity. Four months during which our main prospect for salvation lies in the Trump regime's own blithering incompetence. Four months of Steve Bannon's face Four months this bad, and it is easy to think that everything is doomed. And sometimes I let myself imagine a future where the last survivors are standing on the last meter of landfill that has not been swallowed by the rising seas. And they are screaming at each other in an endless, circular argument, you should have voted for Hillary. Bernie would have won. <laughs> it's a pretty picture, right? Now, if we want to avoid this grim meat hook future, the first step is realizing where we are. Trump might be the worst president we've ever had, but he isn't new. The deportations, the dead civilians, and the crony capitalism are all part of a system created by Democrats as much as Republicans. Mm -hmm. all reinforced by adult, bipartisan voices in respectable, badly cut suits. <laughs> Our president, send them all to jail. Our president is working within an infrastructure bequeathed to him by past administrations, Democrat and Republicans. Remember, Trump is not a builder. He is not a builder of skyscrapers and not of gulags. He just makes money licensing his name. And you know what else isn't new here? What isn't new is Trump's authoritarianism. Now, Trump might be a soft little rich boy, but he is a bloated pea in the Duterte, Erdogan, Putin, Orban pod. Trump is just following a trend, a trend towards fascism. Under pressure, countries are turning inwards. They're turning towards strong men, looking for someone to blame. They are dropping bombs and hardening borders launching raids and building walls. And maybe the only thing that is unique about Trump is that he's all stick and no carrot. He seeks to destroy those aspects of the state that might help its citizens while bolstering the state's prisons, its deportations, its repression. And even those Pepe loving brown shirts in the streets aren't unique to Trump. They're the same sort of fascist barnacles that demagogues always gather around them. The same legions of violent men and women with nothing to offer the world but their victim complexes, their unflattering flag-themed costumes, and the sticks that they smash over protesters' heads. Trump follows an old playbook. He hammers away at the false dichotomy beloved by all of these strutting, puffing, strong men. Like him, they divide their countries into the real people and the fake people. 
The fake people, that category, usually encompasses ethnic minorities, impoverished refugees, or decadent urban elites. The real people? Now here, here the trumpets paint a fine picture. The real people are the supposedly decent, humble, pious, patriotic. But most importantly, they are the silent, or were silent, until the moment that the authoritarian stepped onto the stage. And at this point, they exist primarily to stand and clap behind him. They wave the flags. He is the voice. You, the American people, are our last line of defense against the media's hit jobs, Trump wrote a few months ago in one of his daily money-hustling emails. The media are not the people. The people who didn't vote for Trump, they're not actually people either. We in this room, we are not real people. We are fake, 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 every last one of us. We do not exist in the Trump world. Now here I want to talk about my own profession for a bit. I am a triple fake. I'm a New Yorker, I'm a journalist, and worst of all, lowest of all, I'm an artist. To the authoritarian, artists are never real people. We are always part of that fake, impure, decadent, and disgusting elite. Now, authoritarians, and Trump is an authoritarian, authoritarians are liars. But like most good liars, they flavor their bullshit with a grain of truth. Historically, artists and power have gone together like butter and bread. We are the gilders of lilies, the court painters of Versailles. All too often, artists have been like Fabergé egg makers, pretending to be revolutionaries. We say a lot of liberal things, and sure, but we exclude the vast majority of people just by the language we use, the rooms we stand in, the ticket prices we charge to enter. We make inscrutable art clothed in, in, in excrutable theory. The art world is but a small sliver in the vast wide earth of people moved by beauty. And in America, artists wonder why so many of those outside the art world seem so indifferent or even hostile to us. But many artists have long since turned our back on them. Or worse, we never considered them in the first place. And this is what we need to remember. For art to mean anything under authoritarians, whether they're in government or whether they're merely men with guns, for art to mean anything, it cannot spend all its time playing into authoritarians' greatest trope. Artists cannot ensconce themselves in wealthy or liberal enclaves. They cannot cede public space to the bigoted, the idiotic, and the craven. Art must go out into the streets, and it must speak to all classes of people in all sorts of communities. It must break out of the art world, because the world is too big and art is too ambitious for any art world to contain it. Art cannot keep being a mere status marker or luxury object. The bloated strongmen want to say artists are an irrelevant elite, but we must prove them wrong. Art is for everyone. Our enemy wants to lock us in a box, and I will be damned if we jump willingly inside. Art must be braver. Art must dare more. Art must be both a refuge and a weapon. Some of the best art is threatening art, but art threatens no one as long as it is entombed in safe spaces where only those who agree with it will see it. Worse, as long as it stays there, it remains inaccessible for those isolated rebels who need it most. Art needs to be out in the world, whispering, seducing, mocking, instilling us with empathy, showing us the world that is far more complicated, far more painful and dazzling than we ever could have imagined. And maybe you think now that I'm putting too much responsibility on art. After all, these are dangerous times. The pen is not mightier than the sword, let alone the predator drone. Our books do not stop bullets. Paintings cannot draw their way through prison bars. But as disappointment and violence spread, the antidote is a generosity that art, at its best, can inspire. Because art is hope against cynicism, creation against entropy. To make art is an act of both love and defiance. And though I'm a cynic, I believe these things are all we have. And what I say here for artists goes for everyone. There is no space now for retreat, Either we confront not just Trump, but all that he represents, the authoritarianism, the racism, the misogyny and kleptocracy, 
or we will be dealing with creatures far worse than Trump later. In a chaotic, interconnected, and rapidly shifting world, many people want two things. They want identity, and they want daddy. They long for a leader who promises not just to keep them safe, fed, and emotionally validated, but who says that he will accomplish these things by punishing the imagined other, the impure, foreign, unreal source of all his homeland's humiliations. And this Trump provides. Trump, a man who cannot govern, is in perpetual campaign mode. He pouts his lips and whips up his crowds against the other. And violence, state or freelance, becomes his defense of the modest, good, forgotten, real American majority. Now, of course, this silent, real American majority doesn't exist, and neither does this other. They're stock figures in an authoritarian's playbook, substitutes for solutions in our complex, impure, and interwoven world. Economic justice is just the first step to beating fascists, orange-colored or otherwise. But the second step? The second step is we need to fight for each other, every last one of us. And I don't mean here to tolerate, like one tolerates a pair of painful high heels, but to proudly say that this world belongs to all of us and that we are not going anywhere. Ethno-nationalists are escaping from neoliberalism's cracks, just as they crawled forth from the rot of 19th century empires, and they are singing the same false and bloody tune. On the, up, on the page, in art, on our walls, and on the streets, we must write better stories. Our moment is now. Molly Crabapple, everybody. Molly's book is Drawing Blood. It looks like this, and I bet we can find it out in the front somewhere. Molly Crabapple. You can also see an interview with her on my show from a year or so ago, The Laura Flanders Show. We have a sign-up sheet at the back. Um, I'm next going to introduce somebody I felt was, uh, I've known as a colleague for, for many years, a, an effective and, and um, incisive media critic and at the same time a media maker, a man who faced with the wrongs of the money-driven media empire created his own uh, alternative voice and has risen to become one of the most um, outstanding uh, alternative voices in our progressive movement. Glenn Ford spent many, many years, it said more than 45, but that can't be true, uh, in the media, former Washington Bureau, White House, Capitol Hill reporter um, for various different outlets. He then launched um, the Black World Report and the Black Agenda Report, and he's currently the executive director of the latter. Glenn Ford. Power to the people. Now, I always say power to the people, and it's not because I have nostalgia uh, for a movement of the previous era. Uh, I say that uh, to keep myself focused on the mission, and the mission is the transformation of society, and you accomplish that mission by defeating those forces that disempower the people and that threaten our species with extinction. Uh, this evening, our job is to discuss the rise of movements that challenge repressive institutions and discourses. Any kind of discussion like that has to talk about who is the enemy and what is the enemy up to and what are the people's forces doing about that enemy and his shenanigans? Who are the allies and who are the potential allies of the people? And we have to decide what forces can usefully, usefully be called part of the people's movement. Is there broad agreement among the various sectors of what people are calling uh, a people's movement? Is there broad agreement on, on principles? Or instead, is there a general state of confusion? The left forum is the biggest 
gathering of its kind of leftists in the United States. And so we're obligated, I think especially, since it's a yearly affair, uh, to talk about what, uh, what happened over the past year uh, that may have made a real profound change in the state of the movement. This past year has seen huge developments. These have been history-shaking events, and I think history will tell us that. Events that have had a very deep impact on the political landscape and an impact on the prospects of defeating the main enemy of humanity. And of course, that main enemy is US imperialism in its global and its domestic manifestations. And those global and domestic manifestations are not just interrelated, they are inextricable. You cannot separate them. I believe that the most far-reaching development in the past year has been the destabilization of the duopoly political system in the United States. And that that has resulted in the Democratic Party becoming, and I'm stealing somebody else's quote here, the Democrats becoming the truly explicit party of the ruling class in the United States. And as such an explicitly ruling class uh, party, the Democratic Party has been definitively, definitively uh, has definitively become the most aggressive war party. This definitive, this definitive war party coalesced. We actually saw it come uh, together uh, this past election season. And it came together in that big nasty tent uh, that Hillary Clinton used as a headquarters in her campaign. Trump disrupted or at least temporarily defeated uh, the Republican Party's uh, establishment. Uh, but that's not what really uh, upset and put into a panic uh, the ruling class. Uh, he also assembled a mass movement, and that mass movement was brought together based on what seemed to be his promise uh, to create an even more virulently white racist white man's party uh, than the Republican Party has, uh, has been uh, since uh, at least 1964 with Barry Goldwater's campaign and certainly uh, since 1968 uh, with uh, Richard Nixon. Uh, however, uh, virulent racism in the Republican Party has not upset the ruling class. It has not driven them mad. Uh, it has not uh, led to a destabilization of the duopoly. The ruling class has been uh, quite uh, fine uh, with having one party uh, whose uh, uh, principle in terms of, of organizing the masses is white supremacy and having another one in which uh, the other folks uh, are in. And it funds both of them. Uh, so that's not what destabilized uh, the U.S. duopoly system. What destabilized the system was when Mr. Trump, uh, rhetorically at least, uh, made noises about lessening tensions with Russia and ending uh, U.S. Uh, regime change policies. And he also made noises uh, about uh, doing something about the free flow of money and jobs uh, to foreign destinations, which seemed uh, to ruling class ears uh, to link him in some kind of alignment uh, with the insurgency that was going on in the Democratic Party uh, with Bern Bernie Sanders. Uh, it was Donald Trump's lack of trustworthiness, however, on foreign policy that was really key <clears throat> to the panic that set in among the ruling class. <clears throat> and when I say the ruling class, I mean as represented in the establishment uh, Republican Party as well as in the Democratic Party. Uh, Donald Trump was not seen as being trustworthy uh, on the issue of continuing U.S. war policies, uh, and that made him into anathema 
for the bulk of the ruling class. And especially, it made him anathema to the spooks and the spies and the assassins and the re regime changers of the intelligence uh, services, but also to those people who these spooks and spies and assassins uh, work, uh, whose missions these assassins are carrying out. The profoundness of the shift that occurred, this flocking of the ruling class into Hillary Clinton's tent uh, can be seen, I think, uh, best uh, with uh, the way the corporate media behave. The corporate media does not have an independent existence in the United States. It is not some other estate out there uh, that somehow functions uh, based upon its own compass. It is owned by uh, finance capital and it operates as the voice of the ruling class. The ruling class uses the corporate uh, media to argue out its differences. Uh, the people have to have alternative media in order to have a righteous conversation about uh, what they would like to happen in society. And so when we see, as we saw, uh, this unprecedented shift of basically the, uh, the totality of the corporate media uh, into Hillary Clinton's camp, into the Democratic camp, and their almost universal opposition uh, to Donald Trump, that is, was, was the uh, most visible indication uh, that the ruling class was upset about Donald Trump. And what were they upset about? I said before, it was not his racism. That's been fine with the ruling class. It was his position, or what they thought was his position, uh, or their anxiety uh, about uh, what his position might be on the continuation of the war policies. And we're talking about the war policies that uh, date from 2011 uh, with Barack Obama. Uh, Barack Obama's mission was to uh, rebuild uh, not just the U.S. image in the world, and he did that uh, with his face and his charm, uh, but actually uh, to reposition the U.S. military to once again try to seize control of this whole energy-rich region, uh, not just Iran, not just Syria, uh, but to project U.S. power uh, deep into Central Asia uh, and with the aim of, of establishing U.S control over that area so that in a future confrontation, an inevitable confrontation uh, with China, uh, the rising uh, economic power, the United States would be able uh, to strangle or threaten to strangle China, to threaten uh, to deny it access to that part of the world and thereby maintain, continue U.S. dominance even as U.S. economic power and other power shrinks. So this is what George Bush was up to in 2003 and he failed, he was defeated. Barack Obama's mission was to try it again and that's what uh, was set in motion in 2011. And it has to be understood that for the ruling class, and they spend millions and millions of dollars funding think tanks, and they have access to supercomputers, and they're not, even if they're stupid, they hire people who are not. And they see the handwriting on the wall, and they know what time uh, that clock uh, is ticking towards. And so they see uh, this battle, this military uh, mission that they're on uh, in what we in general call the Middle East. Uh, as, as being uh, part of an existential uh, struggle. Uh, they believe that if they do not put this stranglehold on this part of the world and somehow uh, uh, put themselves in a position uh, to coerce themselves uh, into a continued dominance, uh, that they are through and they are probably right. And that is what propels them into uh, war and and this feeling that they are in an existential struggle uh, is what uh, caused the panic and this uh, alignment uh, this uh, after the destabilization of the Republican Party that has created uh, this 
this maelstrom, this Niagara Falls of the Russians are somehow uh, destabilizing uh, us. Uh, it is basically, simply, a war cry. That's what this is about. And you are making a fundamental uh, misreading uh, of events uh, if you believe that this the Russians did it mania is, has something to do just with jockeying position uh, for the Democratic Party uh, to gain some kind of advantage. Of course the Democratic Party wants to gain advantage, all parties do. Uh, but that's not what the ruling class is upset about. The ruling class is intent that its uh, United States military offensive uh, keeps moving on. And here's something that really shocked them during uh, Trump's campaign. When he said those words that so upset the ruling class, that, you know, we shouldn't do so much regime change. Uh, maybe we can get along uh, with Russia. Uh, it was expected that his constituency, his base, uh, what we usually call middle America, which is a euphemism for uh, white folks out there, uh, that this group of people was the bulwark of the American pro-war party, or at least the party that could always be whipped up uh, into a war frenzy at the drop of a hat. The people out there who have nukem and just fill in the blanks uh, as their bumper sticker. So when Donald Trump addressing uh, exactly uh, that cohort of people, when they did not bat an eye, when he was talking about what sounded like peaceful coexistence, and they didn't bat an eye uh, when he was talking about stopping all this uh, uh, overthrowing uh, of people uh, with, for no uh, reason, that really scared the hell out of the ruling class and especially the national security <laughs> establishment. Because if Trump's people were not wedded uh, to war at the drop of the hat, then where is the constituency for war? And this told them uh, a lesson, uh, that if they wanted to keep the country at war, fe war fever, they were going to have to work at it. They were going to have to gin this up every day. They couldn't just uh, rely upon the middle Americans that they had relied on uh, to somehow just be ready uh, to jump into regime change and war with Russia uh, anytime uh, they gave a dog whistle. They had to work at it. And now I think we can understand where this, the Russians are colluding uh, with Trump uh, and, and, and trying to wreck our democracy and this unprecedented screaming noise every day, every hour about the Russians. You know, I'm 67 years old. I remember a piece of the McCarthy era. I remember the House on American Activities Committee. I remember the TV show I Led Three Lives, which was about nefarious secret communists uh, doing all kinds of uh, daring things. Uh, there was never anything like the decibel level, the frequency, the insanity, the madness of this anti-Russian uh, campaign that we hear right now. This is a sign of a ruling class in panic. And I guess we're supposed to be, uh, if we really are good leftists, we're supposed to be happy because the ruling class is in panic. They acting like the fool. Uh, but uh, panicky uh, people uh, with nuclear weapons uh, and the biggest prison system in the world uh, and all of the gadgets that they have uh, can do some very dangerous things. So uh, one can uh, feel good uh, that the, uh, the rulers are disintegrating uh, mentally uh, but become very scared about what uh, that mentally deficient uh, person might do. Uh, <clears throat> So we have to understand uh, that this anti-Russian campaign uh, is a war cry. So who's picking up uh, the chorus on this? Uh, one of the reasons that it's so dangerous is that uh, people who would be thought of in previous uh, times as allies of the movement, and I think that would include folks like 
Maxine Waters, for example, uh, not necessarily part of the movement, uh, but someone who could be uh, called upon in previous uh, eras uh, to uh, be maybe of some use. And yet here we have a Maxine Waters uh, who is, uh, who believes now everything that the CIA and the NSA say and forgot that she herself back in the 90s uh, charged that the CIA was responsible for bringing crack into LA. She's forgotten this entirely because she's singing this war song uh, about uh, the Russians. Uh, the whole Congressional Black Caucus has joined in this anti-Russian chorus. And we have to understand it as a pro-war chorus that is singing a war song. And for their kind of resistance, the Democratic Party's kind of resistance, the anti-Russian theme is a song of resistance. So we have to understand when they get excited uh, at what they believe uh, is, is, uh, is a is an anthem, uh, is actually a call uh, to war. And, and this presents us uh, with, real, with real problems. Uh, it addresses that question that I raised uh, early on. Who are the allies and potential allies of the people, and what forces can usefully be called part of the people's movement? What forces can usefully be called part of the real resistance? If you are resisting uh, Russian collusion with Trump, then what you are resisting is a fantasy. And if you are simply resisting Trump, the idiot in the White House, then you are simply a tool of a Democratic Party strategy. And that strategy is to gain advantage. <laughs> When I say that the Democrats are now the driving engine of war, uh, that means they are the driving engine of US imperialism. And I'm also saying that they have nothing else to offer but war and imperialism. And even more so now that they have definitively become the party of the ruling class. War is not something that real movement folks should oppose just on principle uh, because they don't like the idea of other people being killed. Uh, it's a matter of self-preservation. Uh, uh, when, when the imperialists uh, go to war and invest uh, in war, uh, they create uh, corresponding structures of repression uh, at home for those who might resist war. But when they decide uh, that they are going to absorb all the public and private wealth of the home country, just as they have been doing with other countries all over the world with all their centuries of imperialism, then they must uh, put another layer of repression uh, on the existing uh, mechanisms. So, so we should not see uh, opposi our opposition to war uh, as just some kind of favor that we are doing to the people who are victimized by the U.S. war machine. Uh, the U.S. war machine requires that there be a corresponding repression of us uh, here at home. Uh, that's the kind of, of uh, function of the uh, U.S. war machine uh, that Maxine Waters has forgotten. So I think that I've taken up uh, much more time than I've been allotted. Uh, but I also hope that it's clear that what one of the things that I'm saying uh, is that we need a rejuvenated anti-war movement in this country. And all of our movement politics uh, must be an anti-war uh, politics, or else we are defenseless against this kind of strategy on the part of the Democrats, uh, who pretend that they are somehow an alternative uh, to the fascist-sounding and uh, definitely virulently white 
uh, nationalist forces in the Republican Party, but are themselves intent on a war policy uh, that can mean the, extens the extinction of the entire uh, human uh, race. So I want to give a salute before I leave uh, to Ajamu Baraka. Ajamu Baraka is not only is not only uh, the former vice presidential candidate of the Green Party, uh, but he's also an editor of Black Agenda Report. And uh, his campaign uh, currently is to pull together a black alliance uh, for peace so that there is an explicitly black uh, anti-war mechanism. Uh, black folks, <laughs> most people don't remember that, that uh, SNCC and other early uh, civil rights organizations uh, were opposed uh, to U.S. imperialism and the then uh, not, not so big Vietnam War before there was a large anti-war movement and that Julian Bond was ejected uh, from the Georgia legislature uh, because of uh, his resistance uh, to the war uh, and uh, to the draft. And we have to resume uh, that position as the uh, foremost uh, opponents uh, of war in this whole spectrum of movement, uh, of a movement uh, that we're building today. And so I salute Ajamu uh, for bringing us back uh, to uh, where we need to be in the future. Power to the people. Glenn Ford, everybody. It should be said that Jamal Baraka's organization is already scoring incredible victories around the country, and his email list is well worth becoming a, a member of, because he'll keep you up to date with what's happening, and it's been good news so far. I want to point out the time. It's 8.20, so if you've been fasting, um, I think it's that time. Uh, you can break that fast, and thank you for being with us in this moment. Um, if we had a media, if we had a Hollywood that was worth its salt, we would have had a blockbuster movie made about our next speaker. Um, but maybe that will happen. Maybe someone's working on it right this minute. In the absence of that movie, if, it, if we just had this, uh, had this movie, I could say, well, Sekou Odinga served many years, Panther 21, you would know what I was talking about. But because we don't have that history, to our fingertips, I'm going to be careful. I'm going to read his story as we have it so that we give an opportunity not just to him to be honored, but for us to learn. Seiko Odinga is a Muslim citizen of the Republic of New Africa, former member of the Black Panther Party, Black Liberation Army, and for 33 years, a US-held political prisoner of war. Sekou helped establish and was a leader of the party's Harlem Bronx chapter before being targeted by the FBI's COINTELPRO program. He escaped arrest and trial as one of those targeted in the 1968 New York Panther 21 case. Forced underground, Sekou was sent to Algiers to help establish the party's international section. In the mid-1970s, he returned to the United States and continued to struggle underground until his capture on October 23, 1981. Convicted in both state and federal court, Sekou served 28 years in federal prison on two counts of the Federal Racketeering Influence Conspiracy Organization Act, or RICO, and the liberation of Asada Shakur. In 2009, he reached a mandatory release date and was paroled to New York State to begin serving a 25-to-life sentence for the attempted murder of six NYPD. Five years later, a legal victory resulted in a parole hearing and his November 25, 2014 release from the Clinton <coughs> Correctional Facility. Seku Odinga will tell us some of the work that he is engaged in, but suffice to say there is a book coming out. So maybe the book will be made into the movie 
Look for me in the whirlwind, in the whirlwind from the Panther 21 to the 20, to 21st century revolutions. It's coming out this year from PM Press. Seiku Odinga. Thank you. Who the believe in that Shaitan? Jean Bismillah, Rahman Rahim. A shadow and la ilaha illallah, a shadow and Muhammad Rasulullah. I bear witness that there is no God but God, and Muhammad was his last servant and prophet. His last prophet and servant. Assalamu alaikum. Peace. Greetings to everybody. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for that welcome. Thank you for that adulation or whatever it was. I'm, it took me by surprise. <laughs> I want to thank the Left Forum for the opportunity to speak to you tonight. Resistance. Resisting, challenging state repression. This is the theme this year from the Left Forum. I think it's a real good uh, theme. It's, it's, this is a good time to be talking about resistance and, and those who have resisted. Resistance to what and to and who are those who resisted? Mm -hmm. To make it clear, for me, I'm talking about resisting fascism, capitalism, white supremacy. I'm talking about resisting the, the police brutality in our communities. And I'm talking about those who have resisted that in the past. I'm talking my, about my comrades left behind, political prisoners, prisoners of war, that have been forgotten by so many of us who call ourselves on the left. Far too long, the so-called left in the U.S. has ignored our resistance fighters, our captured warriors. This must end. No movement, no grouping, calling themselves the left of an oppressive nation deserves the ta that title who will not at least demand the release of the captured fighters. How can we expect our youth to carry on the, this work if they know that they will probably be abandoned if they are singled out by the state? I am a former U.S. political prisoner of war. I and others have been criminalized, convicted by the federal and state court systems. I served 33 years in federal and state prisons across this country before the courts in New York forced the parole board to release me. When I walked out of Clinton Correctional Facility, I left behind many comrades, Sundiata Coley, Imam Jamil Alameen, the former H. Rap Brown, Herman Bell, Veronza Bauer, Chip Fitz. Chip Fitzgerald, Robert Seth Hayes, Mumia Abu-Jamal, Rochelle McGee, Anthony Jalil Bottoms, Ed Pointexter, Kamal Siddiqui, Dr. Matulu Shakur, and Russell Maroon Schultz. These were members of the Black Panther Party and the Black Liberation Army who helped lead the black liberation movement of the 1960s and 70s. I mention them because they represent the colonized nation of Africans born in America who have been robbed of their roots, language, religion, identity, and culture. And because they represent the long continuum, continuum of black freedom fighters in the struggle for black self-determination, self-defense, and liberation 
Also left behind were David Gilbert, Tom Manning, Bill Dunn, Jan Larmer, some of our white anti-imperialist political prisoners and prisoners of war, who stood and worked in solidarity with the Black Liberation Movement and other movements. I also left behind Comrade Lin uh, Leonard Peltier from the American Indian Movement. And I left behind Oscar Lopez Rivera, who today we can say is free, or reasonably free. He's out. And welcome home, Oscar. I'm happy to be able to say those few words about Oscar, because Oscar was a very close comrade and friend. And I'm, I celebrate this year great victory that, of the Puerto Rican independence movement and the Puerto Rican people. But most of the, the political prisoners that I was just speaking about have been locked up for more than 30 or 40 years. Then there are those forced into exile, like Asada Shakur, with a $2 million reward and a most wanted terrorist label on her. Nahanda Abiel Doom, William Morales, Pete O'Neill, and others. Bear with me. There are just, these are just some of the radicals and revolutionaries from the left movements of the 1960s who challenged and resisted state violence, racism, and white supremacy, imperialism, capitalism, and colonialism. 50 years later, they are the legacy of COINTELPRO, the FBI-directed counterintelligence program and war on radicals, revolutionaries, and the left. The U.S. denies, dismisses, dismisses, and ignores the existence of political prisoners and prisoners of war, a contradiction highlighted by the esteemed scholar, author, and advocate for release of political prisoners, John Henry Clark, when he noted that, quote, first it must be recognized that we were brought here against our will, thereby making us en masse political prisoners. Ours has been a continuous struggle, starting with the capture, the Middle Passage, slave revolt, and each successive generation of revolutionaries. The black freedom fighters who resisted militarily in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, following the tradition of Denmark Vesey, Nat Turner, and Malcolm X. End quote. Not only do political prisoners and prisoners of war come from the movements for black liberation, but there are indigenous, Asian, Puerto Rican, and white anti-imperialist political prisoners and prisoners of war from our other left organizations. My and other experiences as political prisoners and prisoners of war demonstrate that denials to the contrary behind these prison walls and towers prison administrators, prison guards, parole boards, prosecutors, and police organizations recognize who political prisoners are, and more important, how far the state will go to keep them off the streets. This makes political prisoners and prisoners of war targets for especially pernicious and constant levels of punishment and harassment. They suffer repeated parole denials, and, de and are denied the most basic of privileges. They're given inordinately long sentences, decades of solitary confinement, and death by medical neglect. For the U.S. to acknowledge the existence of political prisoners and prisoners of war would be to admit that there are fundamental injustices that stem from the settler colonialism that built this country, that the internally oppressed nations, the indigenous people, New Africans, Puerto Ricans, Mexicans, Hawaiians, etc., 
have the right to freedom and self-determination. They have a right to struggle using whatever tactics and strategies, armed and otherwise, for their self-defense and liberation as guaranteed by the UN, the Geneva Conventions, and the U.S. own Declaration of Independence. Throughout much of the discourse on the so-called failed policy of mass incarceration, the roots of mass incarceration are never examined. Historically, from black reconstruction to the black power movement, mass incarceration has been used to repress, control, and destroy black self-determination in the same way that the war on poverty and the war on drugs was used. This is the same way the war on terror and the xenophobic war on immigrants is being used to control and repress Muslims and immigrant communities today. These are strategies of war meant to dismantle, disrupt, and otherwise neutralize poor working class families and communities. They are meant to pre prevent self-determination and the potential for militant resistance. As the Black Panther Party clearly demonstrated with the its 10 point platform and program, resistance does not happen in a vacuum. When the, when the Black Panther Party implemented survival programs such as free breakfast for children, health clinics, food pantries, clothing drives, sickle cell anemia testings, police patrols, it was a radical response to the social injustices endured by poor and working class black families and communities in this country. The purpose was to politicize the people as to the ways in which capitalism, imperialism, and, and colonialism were functions of a state apparatus that was responsible for the hunger, poverty, and oppression. It was to, it was to, nurture, to nurture a culture of self-determination while building a movement of resistance. It worked. Young people joined the Black Panther Party and other left movements in droves. This put the state on the offensive, which was manifested in the violent repression and political imprisonment of those I speak of here today, our political prisoners and prisoners of war. Is there a left movement here in the U.S. today consistent in any way with the left movements of the 1960s? If so, how are we resisting? What are they resisting? Are we resisting a person, a political party, the police, the military, an economic system? Is the US left working in solidarity with left movements around the world? The left movements of the 1960s and 70s made it clear to millions of poor and working class people that U.S. imperialism, capitalism, and colonialism were the enemy of oppressed people, both nationally and internationally. They held political education classes to politicize people with the understanding that police were the domestic occupying military force in their communities, that prisons, poverty, lack of decent health care, housing, education, unemployment were a function of the capitalist system and that a revolution to dismantle they, these systems was needed and possible. <laughs> from slave ships to plantations, from Harriet Tubman, the deacons of self-defense, the African Blood Brotherhood, the Black Liberation Army, and many others, the use of arms was a strategy of self-defense against the terror of white on black violence by the state as well as private citizens. The state's response to them is the foundation of the criminalizing of resistance, especially black resistance. And after 50 years, many of those who was captured while resisting are still being held. 
Our black new African political prisoners and prisoners of war are still being held much longer than Nelson Mandela, who we all cheered. Yet, we hear very little demand from the left to set them free. Do we have a left movement in the U.S. that is challenging this oppression as it relates to millions of poor and working class black, brown, indigenous, Asian, and white people in this country? Even with the examination of the issues of mass incarceration, its roots are still never examined by the left. While mass incarceration has much to do with racism and white supremacy, it is prim primarily about repression and control of colonized people, especially black people as a function of the capitalist state. From black reconstruction to black power movements to war on poverty, the war on drugs, and now the war on terror and xenophobic, war on Muslim and immigrant uh, communities, mass incarceration is used to dismantle, disrupt, and neutralize a people's struggle for self-determination and its potential for res militant resistance. In the 1960s, throughout Africa, Asia, and South America, armed struggle was winning oppressed nations their independence from the yoke of European colonialism. It was believed that the same could be true for the left movement here in the U.S., in the United States. It was not. This didn't happen, and the left suffered greatly. It was war, and sadly, people are killed on both sides in wars. Fifty years later, the global socio-political landscape has changed considerably. One hardly hears, the cap hears that capitalism, imperialism, and colonialism are the enemies of the oppressed people and nations. The strategies and tactics used by the left in the 1960s are markedly different than it is in 2017. There are no mass organizations inspiring hundreds of thousands of young radicals and would-be revolutionary, would revolutionaries into a left movement. The closest we see to that is Black Lives Matter. And the best they do is to mobilize for an event or an event, for an action or an event. But they are not organizing the masses for sustained struggle against an oppressive state. It is the responsibility of the left to educate, agitate, organize the people, especially young people, to resist the oppressor state by any and all means. It is the right of the people to struggle against all forms of oppression, and it is the responsibility of the left to be the vanguard, to show the way. And for those captured and convicted for struggling against the oppressor state, the political prisoners and prisoners of war, they have the right to expect the left to support and demand their freedom. With the mighty force of the state waging vicious war against them, our political prisoners and prisoners of war have paid dearly with their lives, freedom, and families for, for participating in the left movements of the 1960s and 70s. And where is that movement today? Why isn't it standing up for and demanding the release of our political prisoners? That has to change. You and I have to change that. If we are going to continue to say we are part of a left movement, every organization in here should make the release of our political prisoners a priority. That should be part of our organization's our organization's mission and statements. We, we should make the release of our political prisoners part of every speech and in every written statement we make. To me, it appears a bit revisionist, disingenuous, and short-sighted that the left would speak about resistance and not include the support and release of political prisoners and prisoners of war. 
Yet, with few exceptions, most U.S. organizations on the left do not include any mention of political prisoners or prisoners of war or demand their release in their platforms or agendas. To demand the freedom of political prisoners means recognizing that the prison system and political repression are intrinsic to the state violence that supports and enables capitalism to exist. The demand to free all political prisoners is an extension of the demand to stop police terror and murder and to oppose the U.S. foreign attacks and stop the imperialist war on poor people and people of color both here and around the globe. To demand the freedom of all political prisoners is to recognize that a violent, illegal settler state has no right to dictate to movements of resistance how they should resist or what tactics, strategies, or weapons they are permitted to use. The state's most violent manifestations exist in its prison system, in its police and military, all of which is part of the capitalist imperialist state. None work outside this system but help, to, but help it to function. Therefore, at the heart of any talk about resistance, any conference or event about resistance, certainly political prisoners and prisoners of war ought to be included, recognized, and supported by all those on the left. This is a different time than the 60s, 70s, and 80s. The movements has changed. Some of the conditions have changed, which means some of, if not all, our strategies and tactics must change. But the struggle is the same. The system is the same. And sadly, those being punished and repressed and the, the most are the political prisoners and prisoners of war, the same ones who have been held for the last 30, 40, 50 years. Political prisoners and prisoners of war grow out of movements for national liberation. They are or should be central to any left organization's platform or program. Why are political prisoners and prisoners of war ignored by the left in the U.S. when around the world left leftist movements, individuals, and organizations make the fundamental demand to free its political prisoners a part of their struggle for justice. If we are serious about building a movement or culture of resistance, how do we not include politi political prisoners and prisoners of war and those who resisted from previous movements in our work? It is the task of the left to educate themselves and others that, that political prisoners and prisoners of war exist in the U.S. and to demand their release. Before I close, I want to suggest a few things that I think we could do to help right now the, the demand to free political prisoners and prisoners of war. Write your political prisoners and prisoners of war. And if you can, send money. Visit the JerichoMovement.com website, website for, fa uh, for, for the facilities addresses. Join Jericho and other support communities, such as the Sundiata Akoli Freedom Campaign, Family and Friends of Dr. Matulu Shakur, the Northeast Political Prisoner Coalition, and other political prisoner support committees. Challenge the myth that political prisoners and prisoners of war don't exist in America. Organize a meeting in your home, union hall, faith-based institution, the local coffee shop, bar, wherever you regularly hang out, and talk about political prisoners and the demand that they be released. Post information on your Facebook, emails, Twitter, your friend, Twitter your friends and followers to call for the freedom of political prisoners and prisoners of war. And even if you didn't or don't vote, call your elected representative and or the, war, or the White House to let them know that freedom of political prisoners, for political prisoners, 
is a must and that that's one of your demands. Put a poster, a picture of a political prisoner in your home, in your windows. Organize, support, attend rallies, pickets, demonstrate, and call for the freedom of all our political prisoners and prisoners of war. Let's free them all. Let's play the tape. Roll the tape. Hello, Sekou. How you doing, brother? I, I would love to be there next to you, but I am here away, away, away from you. But my love and my respect goes to you and to your wonderful and great compañera, Daki. I would like to take this moment to bring the issue of the political prisoners, the excarceration of the political prison, to the attention of every person that loves freedom, that loves justice, and to point something out. We need a campaign that transcend ideological differences in order to achieve the unity that will elevate the campaign to a position where the excarceration of the political prisoners can be achieved. I, I know how uh, successful the campaign for my excarceration has been. We have three victories in a long, long struggle to free our political prisoners. We date back to 1979 when our five national heroes were excarcerated. We have the victory of 1999 when 11 of my co-defendants were excarcerated. And today we can say that all Puerto Rican political prisoners have been excarcerated, but we were able to come together and Thanks to the support that we receive from different communities, from the Puerto Rican diaspora, from the international community, we have been able to achieve something that is very unique, the excarceration of all Puerto Rican prisoners. I wish that all of us working together, I hope that all of us working together, will, will create the campaign that will bring our brothers and our sisters home. It is absolutely necessary to bring the political prisoners home. It is important because our youth will benefit immensely, immensely from the experiences that our political prisoners, all political prisoners can bring out to the respective communities. And we should emphasize how, how the youth, how the youth should be involved in this campaign. It behooves the, the communities, it behooves our youth, it behooves every freedom and justice loving person to be part of a campaign that will bring our political prisoners home. There is one Puerto Rican that I would like to mention at this moment, Lasana Belen Montes. We Puerto Ricans are trying to make sure that she is excarcerated. We will include her in our support for all political prisoners. Hopefully that we can achieve our goals. There is an issue that I want to bring out and that's the parade, what the corporations are trying to do with the Puerto Rican parade in New York. It is a move that is being undertaken, organized, orchestrated by colonialists who have historically, historically allowed the United States to perpetuate colonialism in Puerto Rico. They have been the allies, they have been the ones who have administered or helped administer the colony. And they are threatened today, they feel threatened because they have a plebiscite organized for June 11th. And they think and they believe that by attacking the 
committee of the Puerto Rican parade by attacking and using me as an excuse, they think that they will be successful. Corporations like Goya, like Yankee Stadium, like Yankees uh, baseball team, like the Daily News, they have every right to do what they want to do with their corporations. They can take money away from the parade, but what they cannot do is dictate to the committee that is leading the parade. They cannot dictate to them, to the, to the committee, what it has to do. And that is exactly what these corporations are trying to do. And they're doing on behalf, in, on behalf of the colonialists in Puerto Rico, who are their allies, who are the allies of the corporations. They are the ones who are in cahoots with the corporations. They are the ones who created a fiscal control board that is trying to exploit to the maximum Puerto Rico and to destroy Puerto Rican identity, Puerto Rican culture, Puerto Rican language, and to take over Puerto Rico in a total, in a very, in a very inhumane way. And we need, we need to get everybody who believes in freedom and justice to to be there, to be present in the in the parade, and we will have a great parade and we will show them, we will show the colonialists that they have no room in Puerto Rico. Thank you and freedom for all, long live this beautiful, beautiful struggle for a better and more just world. There will be a uh, victory celebration, a welcoming event for Oscar Lopez Rivera on June 8th at 7 p.m. at the Hostos Community Center, Community College Main Theater. Uh, you can get more information at all of the websites having to do with um, Welcome Oscar and Free Oscar. Uh, check it out online and let's make sure we show Oscar Lopez Rivera a real welcome uh, to the city of New York. So you've, you've heard from a creator, you've heard from a rabble-rousing critic, you've heard from two formerly incarcerated political prisoners uh, who are with us. Uh, we are going to hear next from a survivor. A survivor, I would say, of many things, uh, including the vagaries of this movement uh, that uh, both Glenn and Sekou uh, talked about. One of the surviving aspects of our movement, I think we need to say, is this very conference. And, and I want to take a moment just to celebrate and acknowledge the survival of this tradition. Uh, it started in the 60s, it is still here now. Um, that's quite a thing. So let's just take a moment to celebrate those who pull the Left Forum together every year. And I want in particular, and just to say, I want in particular to commend them this year for their response to criticisms uh, raised about a couple of panels that worked their way into the schedule. Uh, when they found out that there was a transphobic panel and an anti-Semitic looking panel, um, they stopped those panels. And I want to say that we need to celebrate people who make the right decision instead of crucifying them for having made a mistake. Uh, I believe there was a productive process that happened here and I want to just commend those who were part of it and commend all of us who deal with making mistakes and I have made one or two in my life, if I could just remember. Um, let's stick with our, let's, let's stick with our... Well, what I'm going to suggest is we celebrate our moving forward. We have conversations with you and others. We're talking about can we move together forward instead of separating, flagellating, and moving away. And our next speaker is somebody who's some, who is, I think, a real hero of instead of storming away, storming in. Um, she is a Palestinian-American. She is one of the co-chairs of the Women's March. She
She stormed in with her colleagues and made a difference on that, in that march and in that process, and she will continue to make that difference. I want to thank her for being with us and for giving what she says will be a mom, a mom lecture for the left, Linda Sassour. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, and good evening. Um, Assalamu alaikum. May peace be upon you all. I am excited to be here. Hungry, but I'll get that later. I'll be all right. So, I wanted to take this time out because I think oftentimes when we get into spaces like this with one another, and I consider all of you to be comrades and friends and allies, that we oftentimes look on the outside and start criticizing all the things on the outside, and we're not very self-reflective of ourselves and the movements that we're a part of. So I hope that you uh, entertain me and engage me and understand that I am coming with my own self-critique of myself first and foremost, because I myself am not a perfect activist. I myself have evolved immensely over the years, uh, engaging in dialogue and conversations and storytelling and being part of different movements with different people, and that I hope that we become a stronger and greater and bigger movement by really understanding what we too can do better. So for me, yes. So first, people were talking about, you know, we're getting, um, going down the line or our president might be going down the line of fascism. I mean, I don't know about everybody else, but I'd like to get on the same page. I think we're already living under fascism. That's just my personal opinion. And for those that may not be yet there, early warning signs of fascism, I hope everybody knows them, or if you should by now, very basic, disdain for human rights, controlled mass media, disdain for intellectuals and the arts as we defunded the National Endowment of the Arts, powerful and continuing nationalism, identification of enemies as a unifying cause, rampant sexism, corporate power protected, labor power suppressed, obsession with crime and punishment, obsession with national security, rampant cronyism and corruption, and fraudulent elections. I mean, we're fascism people. That's it. Let's move on. And also for me, and I know for many of you in this room, Trump did not introduce racism to me. He didn't introduce sexism to me. He did not introduce mass deportations to me. He did not introduce Islamophobia or homophobia to me. He did not introduce anti-Semitism. Trump is just the accumulation of all the diseases that many of us have been fighting in this room, some for decades and some for centuries in this country. So let's move on from this Trump conversation because what it does is it undermines and underestimates and forgets the horrors and years of sacrifices and communities that have been devastated by policies from the days of the foundings of this nation. So, we talk a lot about what kind of movements we need and what kind of movements we need to bring back, but really the kind of movement that we need is an intersectional movement. We can't have a, a anti-war movement that's not talking about racial justice. You can't have a racial justice movement that's not talking about health care or talking about immigration reform. So, and I want to also give credit where it's due because oftentimes we steal the intellectual property of black women. That, the, it, that we use this word intersectionality that was coined by Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, a black woman who said that we have to bring those different types of discriminations together and tell a whole story together. So I am asking us in the left that we understand that we have to organize together. And what we have been doing for a really long time is that we've been sitting in different corners of the room, the environmental justice people doing what they want to do. We got the ending police brutality people over here, and then we got the people talking about health care is a human right, and we're talking trans rights and LGBT crisis. We're sitting in all different corners of the room. But what we need to do is build a movement that brings us all to the table. Don't ask me to leave out any part of my identity. Don't tell me don't come to a room and I can't be a woman, I can't be a mother, I can't be Palestinian, I can't be this, I can't be that. I want to show up in all of me. And Audre Lorde said this, she said, we don't live, we can't have single issue struggles because we don't live single issue lives. 
So the left needs to start understanding that the only way to organize is intersectionally. And if we're not building an intersectional movement, then we're going to continue to lose like we've been losing for a long time. Now, people will say, but you know what, Linda, we've won in some places. You've won some battles, but oftentimes when we win in the left, those small battles, you are winning them on the backs of other communities or by throwing other people under the bus. I want to be part of a movement that loses with dignity and principles because winning is inevitable. And when we win, I want to win together. I want to win united and in solidarity. And I do not want to win in a way that leaves any communities behind. We also have to own in the left that even within the left, yes, in the left there is racism. Yes, in the left there is anti-Semitism. Yes, in the left there uh, is Islamophobia. So we too are not exclusive of the very diseases that we claim to be fighting outside of the movements that we are a part of. We also, as the left, as the progressive left, have to understand and learn how to disagree. What we do to each other in the movement is immediately when we don't agree with someone's position, we don't try to engage them in a dialogue to understand their experience or where they come from or why is it that they hold that particular position. Immediately what we do in the movement is we crucify people who are our sisters and our brothers because we'd rather go online and take them down instead of understand them and try to educate them and build them back up. That's not the kind of movement that I want to be a part of. Now, in a lot of the parts of the left, and this is not a criticism of every single individual that is in the left, I'm talking about just in general. Oftentimes when I'm in spaces, people are talking about different issues, and I think to myself, okay, so y'all want to talk about Syria. All right, let's have a conversation about Syria. Where are the Syrians at in this conversation? You want to talk about Palestine? You want to know what the Palestinians want? Where are the Palestinians at in that movement on that table? You want to tell black people how to run a movement? Where are the black people at? We have to understand that when we pick up on issues, that those who are the most directly impacted need to be centered because those closest to the pain are also closest to the solution. You know, Something we also don't do often in the left is sometimes I walk into a space and I look around and I ask myself a very simple question that we need to all ask ourselves. Who's missing at this table? Can't have an anti-war movement and look around the table and you got 25 people trying to organize anything and there's no black women at that table. Or there ain't no Muslims at that table. There ain't no Latinos at that table, undocumented people on that table, women at that table. We have to understand that we need to create spaces that are reflective of the country that we live in if we want to say that we are the true face of America. So when we are organizing, when we are thinking about creating those committees, or we are thinking of putting together a platform that is supposed to be reflective of all of us, then all of us need to be at that table. So when the Women's March on Washington was getting organized, you all know the story, it started out with white women. We could have let those white women organize the Women's March on Washington. They would have done a great job and they would have probably got millions of people to come out and have a march on January 21st. Why did women of color join that effort? Because I wasn't about to let white women have a march and put out a platform and say that this platform represents all women in America. That our voices as women of color, as Muslim women, as black women, as Latina women, as Asian American and Pacific Islanders, as LGBTQI communities, we had to be at that table. And when we came to that table, we put forth the most intersectional platform that our generation has ever seen, a very bold platform where we all saw ourselves in it. Was it perfect? No, it wasn't. But it was a lot of progress from what we have seen for a really long time. So that's the importance of diversifying the movements that we are a part of, because then what happens is more people see themselves in the movement. Sisters and brothers, we can't keep preaching to the choir. We're not enough. We are not enough. And this reminds me that the choir too needs to practice singing. Mm -hmm. 
Oftentimes, you know, we are like, oh, we're so intellectual. We already good on this. We got good politics. That's not enough anymore. Being intellectual is not enough for the movement. Your intellectualism will not protect me if an officer comes to my house or if there's a sweep of Muslims in this country. Your degrees, your books that you have written will not protect my family just like it did not protect Japanese Americans in these United States of America. I'm sure that when Japanese Americans were interned in this country, I'm pretty sure there was a room full of people like you that was like, this is outrageous. I'm pretty sure there were people sitting back at home being like, wow, man, this is really bad. Like, I don't agree with this. From the comfort of their couch, from behind that kitchen window while they saw their Japanese American neighbors and their children be dragged off from putting camps on this U.S. soil. So what you have to understand is that we're not enough. And that I, as a Muslim American, what makes me more honorable than a Japanese American? Do I love my children more than Japanese Americans love their children? Do I have a job that is more honorable than the jobs that Japanese Americans had? What makes me think as a Muslim that I'm going to be immune to a horror like Japanese internment when I live in a country that massacred indigenous people, forcibly enslaved black people, engaged in segregation and in mass incarceration and mass deportation, not under Trump, but under the Obama administration? So, so, People, people will say, no, no, Linda, that's not going to happen. You know, this, they, they won't, no, no, what? <laughs> they said, oh, Muslim ban, that was just campaign rhetoric. You know how it works in politics. They just want to get votes. They weren't even a week in, and they was already trying to ban the Muslims, just like we banned the Chinese at one point in our history. So what I want you to understand is that we have to build a collective movement that was about asking, our, asking ourselves a question. What are we each individually willing to risk for the other? Are you ready to take the leadership of black women who are telling us we must love and protect one another and that is an act, not just a mantra or a chant that we use in the movement? Are you ready to be on a train like Ricky Best and, 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 and Talson and step in for a young black woman and her Muslim friend and lose your life because you wanted to stand up against injustice in a public space. Are you ready to do that? You know, we also got to question the way we operate in the left. Y'all be using words that people don't understand because we are talking only to each other. If my Palestinian immigrant mother does not understand what you are saying, then you ain't doing it right. So when you're all talking about hetero patriarchy, I don't know what, I'm going to give you an example. I did a little research on my own. I went up to random people in the street one day just because I wanted to see if I was the crazy one. I asked people, hey, you know, I keep hearing this word. I don't know what it means. I'm just wondering if you know. Please define neoliberalism. <laughs> I swear to God, I'm, and I, I challenge you to do this so, that, so I'm not the only crazy one. Either people told me they really didn't understand what neoliberalism was, or they thought it was actually something good. They're like, well, it sounds like, I don't know, something liberal, like it sounds pretty progressive. So what I'm saying to you is that we have to use accessible language, that the people that we are trying to bring into our movements have to understand what you are saying. They have to relate on a very deep and universal and personal level. So you could be intellectual all you want, and you can have conversations with the people that are around you, and that's cool, and I'm not saying not to use those words, but I want you to understand that we gotta get deep into these communities. Communities who English is not their first language. Communities who don't have 28 master's degrees and may not even have a high school diploma. People who have literacy rates that are maybe, maybe sixth grade level. So let's start talking the language of the people. And let me tell you why the opposition gets a little farther sometimes than we. They simple. Make America great. Who don't want to make America great? I want to make America great too. It's what I try to do every day when I wake up in the morning. So we got to start using language about that brings people together and lets us see each other in one another. So accessibility of language in the communities that we are trying to organize is key for us to make this room 20 times fold in the left. And 
what I want to say to all of you here in this room, and I specifically want to talk to my white allies, we got to get our cousins. And white folks got to get your cousin, because a lot of us in this room, and I don't consider myself to be white, I'm a very proud woman of color as an Arab woman. It is the US Census and the government that said I was white, and I'm not gonna, about to let the government tell me what kind of race I am or what kind of woman I am. But for white folks in this room, oftentimes you may be progressive and on the left, but you got family members who ain't progressive. So before you start trying to tell other people how to organize, let's start having those courageous conversations in the families and communities that we come from. Because it's often those that we love is those that we love that vote against our special interests. Now, self-righteous politics. Let's be real. The left engages in self-righteous politics. The kind of politics that I want to engage in is called collective liberation. Sometimes I have to make a decision and make a judgment call at that moment. And I might think to myself, you know what, I'm not really feeling this decision right now. It's not really my personal decision that I would make. But you know what? I'm thinking about black people. I'm thinking about Muslims. I'm thinking about LGBTQIA communities. I'm thinking about the most marginalized communities who have already been on the chopping block in this country and un under an administration like this one, they just got higher up on the, on, the, on the list of those who are going to be the first to go out once this administration continues the work that they are doing. So what I'm saying to you here is sometimes it ain't about your individual politics. It ain't about you on an individual level. Are there going to be moments where you are willing to show up in a space that ain't about you, that's about black people, that's about Muslim people, that's about undocumented people? So, so we got to understand that if we are truly in a movement to uplift all of us, that we have to understand that sometimes we got to put our little self-righteous one-issued politics to the side and understand that a decision may actually save another community or even save an individual. And what I will also say to white people who are organizing this movement, many of whom are my allies, and in fact, many of you may already know that I've been under vicious attacks by the right wing, by the alt-right, by right-wing Zionists, and those who have come stood up for me have been predominantly progressive Jews in New York City who I love dearly and I would do anything for them because they show and embody true solidarity and allyship as they have stood in front of me, behind me, and next to me. And the reason why I bring up my Jewish sisters and brothers in particular from groups like Jewish Voices for Peace and Jews for Racial and Economic Justice is because they embody this quote that I work from. This is the place that I work from. It's a quote by an Aboriginal woman by the name of Leela Watson. And she says, if you have come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come here because you believe that your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. So you, you are not saving Muslims. You are not saving black people from police brutality and mass incarceration. You come to these movements because you may not be directly impacted, but you are not free because we are not free, because black people are not free, because undocumented people are not free in this country. So we gotta put that savior stuff to the side and understand that we're building a collective movement with the understanding that when one of us, when one of us is not free, whether they are out here in this world and not free or behind bars and not free, then none of us are free. So, I hope that when you leave here and this entire conference, that you understand that we have to multiply the left times 20,000 folds. And that we have been a great choir and have done and raised awareness on many issues. The time for raising awareness is over. It's very clear to me what the problems are. The time for now is mass mobilization. The time for now is mass organizing, door knocking, making sure that we are going to the most downtrodden who are not actually at the front lines of these movements in the way that they need to because they also don't have the accessibility to be here. That when we are talking about organizing, that we, those who have some means, are putting our money where our mouths are, that we make sure that 
people can get to a conference like this if they can get here, even if that means that we buy them a Metro card. And that if we're going to Washington, D.C., that there are buses that are taking those from the corners of Brownsville to the corners of South Brooklyn to the corners of the Bronx, that they too get access to the very movement spaces that have oftentimes been movement spaces of elitists who know big words and have big degrees and know how to talk about important things. Let's remember the most important people are poor people working class people, people of color who need to be centered in the movement that we claim to be a part of.